please click the subscribe button and the notification icon. It will help us a lot. Hi, this is Rodrigo from Level Up, and today's guest is Erin Kathleen Rodman. Now, we got here somebody who has a really amazing project, and the thing is that we are being seeing this trend coming up about uh, smart cities, but mostly are focusing on things that, that are focused on, let's say, the air quality, the lighting, all these kind of things, but she's actually focusing on a problem that is largely ignored. And I understand the importance of this topic because I come from a country where, where we have constant problems about this issue, uh, which is pretty much how to monitor uh, all the sewage waters uh, when rain comes. So uh, she is the founder of Storm Sensor and she founded it on 2015. In the beginning, it was a simple uh, kind of gauge that it will text you when it started raining, but after many years of hard work and a, a lot of funding rounds, they have been able to create this into something that is way more complex. Uh, it's pretty much kind of a Google traffic maps for sewers and storm water. And they are using empirical data with uh, artificial intelligence and also with a lot of other models to, cal to calculate how the storm water is pretty much flowing through the sewage. So she has been a, she has had a lot of experience when it comes to environmental issues, and I think this is a great solution that is going to allow uh, cities to pretty much analyze where they are failing when it comes to sewage water, uh, how they can act in a way that is going to help them to do better, and how to avoid problems in the future. And again, I, I come from a country where we had a system that has been designed like 200 years ago and has never been updated. And I think that is true for many other cities as well. There were they, the plans for sea, which was just built and never was updated again, never was touched. And now we are focusing on whole different problems because the population is way bigger than these models, these old models predicted that they will be. And we are in many places of the world, we are not prepared to deal with this. So without any further ado, uh, welcome Erin. Thank you, thank you for having me. So how this idea came up to be, because again, like I, as, uh, as we mentioned, this is not something that is, let's say on the top of mind of many people, uh, unless you have been dealing with a lot of issues with this. And, mm -hmm. and, and again, like in my city, for example, every time that it rains uh, and, and that we have a huge rain, we have a, a lot of problems because again, like the, the sewage system was never thought for modern <laughs> problems for uh, the population that we have now. Uh, and, and yeah, we, the, there, there is a lot of problems that come up and a lot of people end up suffering because of it. So how did you decide to focus on this? Uh, well, I, I didn't actually start out in life dreaming to work in sewers. So it kind of was a transition over time. Um, but when I was an environmental consultant, we had a stormwater group. And for the first time in our company's history, we were not making money. So we were losing money, even though we were really busy. And it turned out that it was simply because when we had to go to someone's site to sample, we'd wait until it rained at the office, then we'd go to their site. But just because it was raining at the office didn't mean it was raining there. So people were going out four times before they could collect a sample. So they couldn't write uh, builder hours. And if they did build them, we had to write them off, which is not conducive to consulting. And I was like, that's insane. That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Why don't we just have a rain gauge that texts us when it rains? So they said, well, why don't you go invent that? And then I said, I will, I'll call it, I'm gonna call it storm sensor. So, um, I did, but it wasn't until years later because at the time I had no hardware or software experience and I didn't know what a startup was. Um, and then, very long story short, um, once I decided to actually start Storm Sensor as a company, I was interviewing with customers, obviously starting with consultants because that's where my background is, but then I started talking to cities and I realized 
that while consulting is a good market, it's an important market, um, industrial and construction stormwater compliance are both incredibly valuable things. Uh, what it wasn't the biggest need because what we need is to for our cities to understand how much water is flowing through their systems. They don't need right now to know what the turbidity of the water is in their storm system, what the pH is, what all these other issues are. They only need to know volume. Um, so what that allowed us to do was to move away from some of the chemical sensors that have a lot of maintenance issues and only focus on building uh, sensors that monitor uh, flow, so depth and velocity, and then we added temperature as a water quality issue or an indicator. And that meant that we had almost no maintenance required for our sensors, that we could scale massively, and we could actually address a key issue of a city, like you said. Um, so many of these sewer systems were built, were constructed for much smaller populations. They had much less pavement, so much less runoff, and um, our rainfall paradigms are shifting. So we're starting to see a lot heavier rain, rains and a lot more frequent storms than we did previously. So all that combined means that our systems can no longer handle the water that's flowing through them. So we provide this data that allows cities to, like you said, Google traffic maps for sewers, identify those priority areas, the highest risk areas, and really target the funding to address those specific locations instead of kind of crossing your fingers and hoping it works out okay if you fix something over there. Yeah, that, that is something really important to find out which are the key areas that have the most problems mm -hmm. because, again, it seems we don't have the info regularly since cities don't have their information, they can just try to fix all other areas but maybe don't know that these do not have that many problems um, uh, or that they are not as urgent. Mm -hmm. So to have that information as well can can help us to solve up the most pressing issues in the beginning and then maybe move out to other areas where it's not needed that fast. And, and I have seen a couple of videos uh, from your website that pretty much you are in there, like going deep <laughs> into, the, yes. in, into the sewers. Uh, that is something that uh, not many people will be, uh, will like to do this. <laughs> uh, uh, where the, how do you develop this need kind of, or, or this want to, to fix environmental issues? Uh, again, like, I think we hear this from all the, over the angles that we need to start taking care of the, of the planet, mm -hmm. right? But, uh, let's be honest, not many people, uh, get that desire to actually go and, and, and do something like this. So how did you develop like the want to, to help these areas? I think it's a combination of things. I mean, our, my sisters and I, our parents raised us. Um, we recycled like crazy before recycling was even a thing. Uh, we would always go hiking. We would spend a lot of time in the fields around our neighborhood where we lived in Illinois. And I remember uh, one time my mom took us walking to the field. There was this big rock that we'd go and find all the different like fool's gold and mica and everything on the rock. And we'd see all the monarch butterflies on the milkweed. And one day we went there and the whole thing was plowed and they were building a new store. And I was so sad because all of the beautiful things have been crushed. And I think that was my first, I might have been six or seven. That was my first like real moment where I under, understood what humans have a tendency to do their, to their environments. Um, so ever since then, I've been aware of it. I've tried to make the right decisions, you know, not eating meat. If I do eat meat, it's grass fed. Um, all of those things. We don't have a car. Um, but then there's so much more like our, my life, I can make the right decisions to do the things that help the planet. I can also, which is way harder, by the way, build a solution that measurably impacts and benefits communities now, and then also provides them the data that they can use to mitigate any issues or um, address concerns in the future. And that's really cool because it's actually, we're actually building something that literally impacts and benefits the world. And in doing that, that brings a lot of brilliant people um, on board of us because 
they also want to do what they do that, that they're very good at, but then to actually see the positive impacts that our work has is very inspiring. Yeah, and this is a topic that I've been following quite a, for quite a while, kind of how to use like rainwater uh, in a more productive way, because so far, like the solution is low, it just goes to the sewage and goes back to the rivers and sea. But uh, I think we're we are losing like a huge opportunity to kind of reuse this water for other purposes. Uh, uh, we can use it to filter it and have a potable water for the people. We can use it to, to kind of irrigate uh, the plantations and things like that. Uh, I even saw like uh, in a startup that did this very special concrete that you could put a lot of water into it and it would absorb it so that it goes to the uh, to the ground and so that way because something that happens is that when you usually when you we just put like concrete on and, and we build the cities like uh we create other problems because we had this area where the land was used to receiving water and now it's not receiving water and because of that like many other things uh happen and and, and for example in 2001 we have a, an issue where we had a, a, a huge earthquake and there was this uh, space of a city that they have built to as a res residential area, but they did a a really hard cut into the mountain to to kind of build all the houses in. And before this earthquake, we had a lot of rain, which kind of because now there wasn't any trees supporting the earth, like. Now we have the, like this huge mass of mud in the shape of a mountain, and then we had the earthquake, and the mountain came down and, and ended up killing like a lot of people, and 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 that's something that if you see like let's say history in Latin America happens a lot like that if, that is wasn't even the worst <laughs> uh, thing that happened because there's videos of of complete cities that. Uh, at some point, they uh, because they had a lot of rain, like you can see the whole city going down because they didn't plan, uh, they didn't thought about the earth when doing the constructions. And when the city, pretty much what happened was that when they had this whole rain uh, going down, like it kind of uh, dig the earth below the cities and then everything just went down it and 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 there are if, if you look for videos like that in youtube you will find some examples that are terrifying to watch because it's like again like a whole city moving like a river it is not something uh easy to watch but again many of these problems comes because we have been creating cities in thinking in all models uh mm -hmm. And back in the day, like we could defend it, they didn't have the data, they didn't have the knowledge, but now we do, and now we have the technology. But as you mentioned, like trying to implement these solutions is usually really expensive. So I think your startup will be able to help a lot on to kind of put the first steps. And again, like try to find out the the areas where we're going to have more problems with, and then kind of put the first steps to solve this kind of issue so we don't have to deal with that. Absolutely. I also think what you, the point that you just made where people, when they're building these neighborhoods or these towns, they're not thinking about the environment. And as a result, it literally can come crashing down around you. And I think that it's really important to understand with exactly that, that thinking about saving the environment or cleaning our water or cleaning our air, it's good for the planet, but it's also fundamental for humans. So you don't even have to do it for the earth if you don't want to, If you, but you do it for your community and for your society and for the economic health of everything that you are building and that you are a part of. It's a positive benefit for humans, not just the planet. And I think like differentiating that, which is what so many people do, um, hurts us in the long run, obviously. We're, we're not very good at it. Yeah, and and how do you see this integration? Like, because 
on one hand, like I see these amazing ideas like yours, uh, mm -hmm. these amazing solutions, but on the other side, like I'm, I'm not seeing them being implemented fast enough. So right. how long do you think it's going to take us like, uh, as a community to kind of understand that we have to bring the two together and, and okay, like we can create cities, but we actually have the technology now to create it into a way that integrates well into the environment, that it helps us out to avoid this kind of disaster in the future. Uh, how long do you think it's going to take for us to, to kind of start mixing the two together and, and, and put these solutions into practice? I think that it depends, and I think that it depends on a couple of things. Um, first off, it's the stories that people live and the stories that they tell themselves. So if you're in an area that is regularly flooding, you have sea level rise, you have big storms, you have all these issues, and you're constantly doing a backflow in your pipes and flooding in your communities, it's going to be much more front of mind as an issue that you want to resolve and you want to resolve it quickly. And in doing that, or as a result of that, or because of that, um, it's a citizen movement because people's homes and businesses and livelihoods are actually impacted directly. So they're going to push their government to deploy situations or solutions like we offer um, to fix the problem because it, it directly impacts them. For areas where it's not as obvious, I think it takes oftentimes a little bit longer. It will take a big flood or it will take a big pollution issue to actually make that difference. And then on the other hand, I think some of the things that we're dealing right now with the COVID-19 and the horrific economic shutdown, what that's also done is shown us that as humans, we can coincide with the environment and have clean air and have clean water and be able to see the skies in New Delhi and to see the fish in the canals of Venice for the first time. All these things and people are still around. It's not necessarily all or nothing. So I think once we start rebuilding our economies, and rebuilding our communities after or as part of this crisis, that is the perfect time to start implementing solutions like what Storm Hazard Sensor has developed, like what a number of start startups are developing to get you the baseline data that you need to make decisions to ensure that you have clean air and clean water moving forward. Yeah, I think that something that was surprising is how fast all these things that you mentioned happen. Like to 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 see that it doesn't take one like a huge change and to like a long time for to see the benefits of us kind of modifying our behaviors so, yes. so i think that is amazing uh to, to see and, and yeah i do think that there is a lot of things that will change thanks to this uh an entrepreneur that i follow a lot is jason Fried, and he's the the founder of a, a project called basecamp which allows mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, pretty much uh, manage a lot of projects online and he has been like a, a, a defender of the idea of working remote for for a long time <laughs> and, and, and I have implemented a lot of that uh, a lot of those things in, into my business but yeah I, th I do think that there is a lot of let's say practices in businesses that are that are being done because <laughs> It has been done for a long time, but they don't make sense anymore. Uh, they, I, I think the one of these examples would be like meetings, and and I have been in a lot of meetings that I had because they put me there, and it's like uh, a three-hour meeting goes on, and and then at the end it's like why am I am here? And it's like oh yeah, we forgot like you should bring this thing up or something like that. And my mind was this could have been done in a in an email <laughs> like this could have been just an email and we could have saved a lot of time but and and now that sounds silly but again like if those were three hours that i wasn't advancing in, in in the work that i needed to do because i was just stuck in a meeting that that i didn't need it to be in that means that we are wasting more energy more resources than we need to uh Again, paperwork, many companies are still using a lot of, uh, of paper to kind of put on resources that we could manage easily using Google Documents or, or, or Dropbox or something like that. And, 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 and these things are tiny little things that we don't think much about them, but when you 
add that these things are happening every day in, in, in not just one company, but in all companies, like all these tiny things adds up to the kind of the impact that we have not only, let's say, in our mental health and on our usage of time, but also on the environment as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we have nine people on our team right now, so we're pretty small, but three of them aren't within the Seattle area. So we're based in Seattle, and then we have a team member in Tennessee, one in um, Southern California, and one in Portland, Oregon. So we've had online video, or like all of our meetings, the bulk of our meetings online, like our daily stand-up, which lasts five minutes. But it's been interesting because you see, and you read about uh, the issues that people have trying to use Zoom or different video conferencing technologies for the first time. But we've been doing it for so long. Like we have um, our stand-up and then, uh, you know, Greg will start and then he'll name the next person who goes, who names the next person who goes. So we're not talking over each other. We have all these systems in place to make it really easy. And while we have an office here in Seattle, um, typically people work from home two or three days a week anyway. So now we're going to keep that office because people do like to work there whenever we are allowed to go back and we have a warehouse and we have our, our testing facility. But working from home has been amazing and not traveling for me to go to a bunch of meetings and conferences has been astonishing. The amount of time saved not being at airports or going to and from airports or on airplanes and um, all of that is just my time. I can actually sit and work and get things done and work with my team. It's been astonishing. I love it. I can't imagine having to go back to work and like forced to go back to work in an office. Yeah, definitely. And, and, and again, like there are many instances where that cannot be done for all companies, but I do think that we, we do need to kind of push now uh, the practice for those parts of the companies that can be done online. And, 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 and again, I understand that not everybody can work online, like some people actually need to be in an, an office environment to get work done uh, for wh whatever reason, uh, because they are wired that way or, or, or whatever. But uh, that being said, again, uh, I, I do think that there was a lot of resources that are being spent uh, thoughtlessly. Like uh, there are countries in Europe where the work, the working day has been reduced to six hours, I think, and the productivity is, is not dropping, but actually rising. And the reason why is because if you measure most people in offices, like they are not working nonstop eight hours, like they do some work here, then go to Facebook, do some work here, then go to YouTube, they do some work here, then go to Twitter. But now that they have only six hours to do the job, they feel like a kind of a little bit more pressure to to add faster. And, and now they are uh, doing all their work way faster than if they had the eight hours because now they have that tiny pressure. And, and again, like these are tiny things, but those two hours that we're, that they are not using now in the office is saving a lot of resources that again impact the environment impact a lot of other things and and even the their mental health like at the end because they have these two extra hours to actually spend time with their family and going out and and, and enjoy a little bit like the mental health all, also improves so 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 yeah i think that this is a shift that needs to be kind of studied because technology is allowing us to do a lot of things that we were not being uh, able to do for, like even like a couple of years ago, there was a lot of things that we couldn't do back then that we can do now but because the technology exists, but like the news hasn't spread around, let's say. <laughs> exactly. And what I like to see now is that with people working from home, um, everyone, I mean, our parks, they're not full, so we shouldn't close them. Um, but to see people walking around and being outside on calls, that's amazing because they're getting exercise. They're out in the sun. They're not sitting in front of their computers all day, every day. And I think your point about the six hours like they do in some places in Europe is brilliant because I can focus really well for four or six hours a day, and that's it. Like, I can sit and listen to someone talk for a little while after that, but... I have a, a good six hours of intense focus in me and that's about it. Yeah, me too. Like I, I can do, once I start like studying the productivity and kind of putting these things into my life and, and, and using them, I realize really fast that I, 
if I really focus, I can do a lot of work. But after three or four hours, depending on the work that I'm doing, like I'm done, like I'm completely done. My, <laughs> my, my brain is fried. So on, on, on one end, like that's kind of great to know <laughs> because it's like, oh, I don't have to be like full working monster on for eight hours. So that's cool to know. But on, on the other hand, it's like, it's also hard not to, not to be hard on ourselves because my mind goes like no like you just work for hours you should be working more and it's like i'm fried leave me alone <laughs> and it's just my okay. mind telling me that <laughs> the question though is did you accomplish what you wanted to accomplish did you finish and if you finished then you could have spent eight hours doing the same thing and still finished like as long as you get it done that's what's important yeah, that, that, that is the, the thing that I'm trying to focus. Uh, again, like this is something that is completely on my head, in my head that it, the voice that's telling me that I should be doing more is like, the gold is done, <laughs> like leave me alone. <laughs> and uh, oh, something that I wanted to ask you as well is that you mentioned at the beginning that you didn't know much about the technological part of, of building the solution of building storm sensor. So how do you approach this? Uh, and, and this is kind of the stories that I really like to explore because when people outside, uh, let's say people who, who are aspiring to become entrepreneurs, see solutions like yours that on the outside, they look like very, very complex. And I'm sure that they there is a lot of complexity about it. Like they immediately think like, oh, but she's a genius. Uh, probably she just <laughs> like, that's, that's easy for her and things like that. But, but then what I find out most of the times is that uh, the people who created the idea, they, they do not have the, the technical knowledge to, to build it. They, they actually look for other people who, who are smarter, or have uh, the knowledge to do these kind of things and put it together. So how was your journey? Uh, as a non-techie person, like you mentioned, uh, you didn't even know that what a startup was and things like that. So how was your journey to kind of develop the skills to put together a team that is actually capable of creating a solution that wasn't invented before? Well, it was um, not in a super straight line because I didn't know how to do it. <laughs> so I learned a lot along the way. Um, but I'm saying 2014, that's when I decided that maybe I wanted to actually build Storm Sensor. Um, and I was in San Francisco at the time for I was living there and everyone I talked to said they were in a startup. So I said I was in a startup too. It's called Storm Sensor. So I started telling myself that I was doing this, um, but again, had no idea. So I talked to um, accelerators, startup accelerators based in the Bay Area. And I asked them, what's a startup? Uh, what do you look at or look for in companies that are joining your program? What do you look for in companies after they've left your program? Um, and then I asked the same questions of accelerators back here in Seattle, just to understand what I was getting myself into. I still had no idea. Um, and then I took a product management class and used Storm Sensor as my product and then pitched that at the end of the class and won the little the Shark Tank thing at the end. Um, and then I was actually accepted into an accelerator program. And importantly, though, before this, before I could get accepted into anything, I had to have a product or at least an idea. A product. And again, I can't, I can't write code and I can't build hardware. So on the hardware side, I Googled a, uh, I went to Google and I Googled electrical engineering professor water and came up with Dr. Bruce Darling at University of Washington. So I sent him an email and I said, I need, I don't, I was wondering how to build hardware. So if I could just take 20 minutes of your time <laughs> and you could tell me that, that would be great. And we ended up meeting for two hours. Uh, he built the first uh, circuit board for our design. And he's one of our advisors. He's absolutely amazing. Um, I was introduced uh, by a friend of a friend who met a guy at a party who was a mechanical engineer. So we had coffee and he started doing like our first prototypes, like the hard copy, like literally duct tape in some cases, battery blinky lights. 
Um, in my product management class, I met my first co-founder, Anya, and she was a software, she writes code. So she did some kind of preliminary vaporware. And every, everything I did throughout that whole time and even now, but especially getting started, I went to different startup things, uh, startup events. Um, I am a very, very, very shy person, so I'm incredibly introverted. So I don't like going to group networking events and having to talk to people. It's terrifying. I can't breathe and I get all sweaty. It's terrible. Um, so I set myself a goal, like I'm going to ask three people to meet me for coffee to discuss uh, finding a co-founder or building hardware or building software or raising money. And I set a very small goal for every single event. Um, and then slowly over time, I have built this extraordinary network of business people and technical people and um, investors, uh, customers, cities all over the country uh, that have just been astonishing and helping us. So um, I'd say the biggest thing I did was ask for help. And I was super honest that I had no money. So, and I don't know how to do anything, <laughs> but I'd really like to get this done. And if you could help, that would be amazing. And if they couldn't help, uh, they oftentimes introduced me to someone who could. And through that whole process, we have, I think about a network just directly of about um, 20 contractors, advisors, um, and then our team, of course, who are working on Storm Sensor right now. That is awesome. And I definitely relate with that part of being shy and introverted. I initially was like that a lot. <laughs> I was like <laughs> the kid who ate alone on, on, on school, things like that. Yep. But, but eventually, like I had to put myself through the training of becoming more social, especially once uh, I, I started doing entrepreneurship and, and ended up kind of in the middle, uh, realized that I was kind of an ambiverted kind of person. And, mm -hmm. and uh, if I'm meeting amazing people, like I get energy, but at the same time, uh, let's say if I uh, I'm meet, meeting people who are maybe a little bit more negative or things like that, that drains me a lot, really, really, really fast. And, and I'll, at the same time, I can <laughs> spend all my time alone and, and recharge that way. So mm -hmm. I, I, I think that's pretty cool, but, I, I do know a lot of people who are really amazing at what they do and have this problem of being shy, being really introverted. And and, and you have mentioned that you have had to travel a lot to go through a lot of meetings. Uh, how are you dealing on a day-to-day -day base uh, to kind of, let's say, not be depleted completely out of energy <laughs> by doing all this constantly for months and to no end? <laughs> Um, I consciously take care of myself so that doesn't happen and I have to, otherwise I would lose my mind. So every morning I run between three and five miles a day and then I come back and I do 30 minutes of yoga. When I'm at home, I don't do night note yoga, but when I'm traveling, I'll do 30 minutes of yoga before bed just to calm myself down. Um, I... I read a lot of business books, but at night I read um, my lighthearted, cozy murder mysteries because it's like brain candy and it just lets my brain like kind of think through everything that I've worked through, but I don't have to pay any attention to the story. So it's just a delight. Um, I consciously take time to appreciate the fact that I live in a beautiful place, that I have an amazing husband, that my dog and my cat are adorable and I love them. And um, to take the moments and realize how lucky I am often, daily, repeatedly. When I have time, I cook. We just moved to a new apartment, so I have a patio, so I'm gonna have my garden. So there are all these things that I do that I surround myself with, with my own personal joys um, and exercise to keep myself sane. Because if I didn't run and if I didn't do my yoga, if I didn't take the time to breathe, um, I would just be crying, anxious, mess it would be terrible no one would want to be around me <laughs> it would be awful yeah this is something that uh, i've been thinking about doing the morning rituals as well and uh, I, I think it's very similar to what you're doing like uh, uh i have like my five minutes theory where 
I put like the three things that I'm grateful every morning and mm -hmm. and the th three things that I want to focus on the day and, and kind of do a little bit of, of well, I have the, the daily stoic as well, where there is like one stoic lesson or practice uh, every day and, and that I try to put all this thing. Uh, I do exercise in the morning as well. Uh, the lockdown in my country has been a little bit more strict, let's say. So I uh, I was going to, I, I usually used to uh, walk in the night with my dog and while listening to an audio book, but uh, now I cannot do that because the, the police here are a little bit more brutal about uh, about how they do things when they find people outside. Uh, but yeah, I have been doing like exercise wait in, in, inside my house and playing with my dog a, a, a lot. <laughs> that helps a lot as well. But uh, this is an area I think that most people leave uh, aside that they don't think is really important, but it helps. And as you say, like if I, uh, if I don't do all these things day by day, like if I just miss two days of doing all that, I can I can definitely feel like the drop in the quality of my thoughts. Like yeah. just two days. <laughs> yeah, and it, it makes such a big difference. And it's really hard because I work like my focus hours, if I can focus, you know, like I said, are four to six hours. But I'm working probably 12 to 15 hours a day. So I'm up at 530 to make sure that I can run in time and do my yoga in time to start my meetings, but I try not to start meetings until nine at the earliest because my I'm best early in the morning. Um, and another thing, and I think you mentioned this, I, on Sundays, I pick one thing that I have to accomplish in the coming week. And as long as I do that one thing that week, I'm successful. And then every day I have one thing that I accomplish that day. And as long as I do that, I'm six. So I set myself reasonable goals so I can uh, meet those goals and feel successful every day and every week to the extent possible. I mean, shit goes wrong. Do you let me? <laughs> like, things are horrible all the time. <laughs> but but to, to moderate that, I, I, I try to make it easy on myself. Yeah, in entrepreneurship, we many times have plans, and those yes. plans don't usually go that way. <laughs> oh, my goodness. And coming a little bit uh, on this topic as well, uh, whenever you're feeling like really uh, frustrated or overwhelmed or unfocused, uh, is this the same routine that it's helping you to go back to the center? Or do you do something else when you're feeling particularly like a stress or overwhelmed? I try really hard to walk away from my work at least, um, because I have found that if I'm frustrated and super stressed out and I try doing something, I will break it and they get more stressed out and more frustrated and then try it again. And it just gets, it's like this perpetual cycle of failure. So I, to the extent possible, um, I'm not allowed to touch anything work related until I calm myself down. And it could be like making hot chocolate on the stove or taking my dog for a walk around the block. Um, just anything to separate myself for a minute or reading um, my book. For five minutes. Nice. Just like a thing to step, pull myself away and calm down and then get back to it. So I stop breaking things. <laughs> That's nice to know. And uh, going again on the topic of having plans and not uh, all the times uh, being able to make them happen because things happen. Uh, have you ever had like a failure or something that seems like a failure, but that actually has set you up for success in the future? Yes, many times. I think um, actually every failure or disaster that I've experienced has prepared me for something else or, or led the way to something else extraordinary. Um, gosh, I mean, even this last, we were going to close a, our Series A round and uh, in, in March, and that completely fell apart. We had a $6 million in our pipeline, investor pipeline, and it was gone. Um, 
And if I didn't make, raise money, then I couldn't pay my team. And in three weeks, we had a lead investor. We had this extraordinary team of like our earlier investors who all kind of came together to support us. They put together an event for us to present at. Um, and some of the excellent, like Imagine H2O, we were working with them and they introduced us to this network of people that we would not have met otherwise. And we closed that round in three weeks um, after I missed payroll. I put all of my savings into the company account and I still couldn't make payroll for everyone. Um, I had to furlough my team. I was preparing to uh, file for insolvency. So working with the attorneys to file for insolvency at the same time that I was pitching, you know, 10 new investors a day. Every morning I woke up to between two and five no's. We're not investing. We don't think it's worth it. We can't do it right now. Um, it was like the whole world fell apart. And now as a result of an insane effort on everyone's part, um, I feel like our company is actually in a much stronger place than it would have been. Um, I don't want to say, I mean, obviously being able to raise more money is better because then you have the funding to do more things. But what it's allowed us to do is be able to pay my core team um, what they deserve. It's allowed us to, and it's forcing us to really focus on being efficient and really dialing in on the most critical um, benefits that our solution provide our customers. So no fun and games. We're not playing around. We have shit to do and we're going to get it done and we're doing it streamlined as fast as we can. Um, and it's also introduced us to some really extraordinary investors who are in the flooding space in the climate space, climate change space that we would not have been able to work with previously. And now we are starting projects with them. So, I mean, it was devastating and it was hell and I didn't handle it very well. I went through four containers of Tums in less than a month. Um, it was awful, but that's just one example. We got through it by a miracle. Um, and now that we got through it, I'm a better person. I'm a stronger person as a result of it. My team is like super focused and streamlined on this stuff and our investors and all of our um, supporters are there 100% hardcore working with us. So really hard, horrible failure, also like terrible disaster, but we came out of it absolutely stronger. Yeah, I think this is the, uh, letting aside like all the tragedy from this thing that is happening right now uh, with the lockdown and COVID and all that, I think this will be like a, an amazing learning <laughs> experience for many business owners because I see so far we have had such a good time that I have been able to find some ideas that have been funded like for millions and millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. And I do understand that sometimes the funding comes because they see that the entrepreneur itself, the person itself is 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 the person worth investing in and they are sometimes not investing in the idea of the company itself they know that this can change in the future but i have seen some ideas that i think like how this this how the hell this did idea get funded because it's it sounds like such an horrible idea but this kept happening a lot and i i started like hearing a lot of people talking about this that there were many ideas that were getting funded that uh, shouldn't have been funded because they were not good, but now because of this, the, the, the whole economic crash that we're going through, uh, I don't think that's going to be happening anytime soon. Uh, I think uh, we are going to see investors, as you said, uh, going way harder than trying to find out uh, instead of unicorn kind of business, as they call it, uh, mm -hmm. they are going to try to find cockroach kind of businesses, like businesses that can <laughs> that, that can withstand <laughs> nuclear attacks and things like that. And, and, and this is good because I think your idea is something that is really important that, that somebody's working on, on this solution. And if you can find, and if you can make your business into something that can stand against like incredible odds, uh, and again, like 
a, a global pandemic like we never nobody could have ever predicted that <laughs> like that's the the black swan event that yeah. the biggest black swan event that that we had in, in the history and 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 if your business can uh become something that can survive that then once things get back to normal like things are going to go way more smoothly mm -hmm. I think, I mean, I think so. I hope so. You never know. Building a company is terrifying. But I think that what's happening or what will happen is a lot of the companies that do get funded are companies that are working on really big fundamental problems that need a solution. So they're not shiny, they're not flashy, they're not B2C necessarily, but they'll, they'll, they'll make a difference in how humans continue as a species on this planet. And those are the ones that I think, have the, obviously, personally, um, have the highest value, but they're a lot harder and they take a lot longer. But the ultimate value is far higher than what we would see from uh, another idea that is less. Definitely. Also, if you could pick a phone and call your 17 year old self, <laughs> what advice would you give yourself? <laughs> Breathe, I think. <laughs> you don't have to accomplish everything in a day, you can't. Um, and I think I, I, well, I still am, but I was very impatient and I was uh, very much a perfectionist in a lot of the work that I did as a, as a kid. And I've had to teach myself that I am a human and as a result, nothing I do will ever be perfect no matter how hard I try and that's okay. And I think had I accepted that, then it would have saved me a great deal of stress and trauma over the years to just, my best is actually pretty good and it, being perfect is impossible and that's okay. That's nice. And what is something, uh, this is going to be a tricky question, but uh, when you started this journey uh, and, and through all the experience that you have gone through right now, what is something that you didn't expect at all that happened through this journey that is true like, and it's really important to know? I would say that some things that I would have thought were impossible for me to do, I was wrong. I never thought I could raise money and I've raised almost $5 million. You know, I was taught never, ever, ever to borrow a cent from by my parents. And so and you never ask for money, you didn't ever talk about money. And that is all I have done for the last few years. Um, and gosh, I would, I mean, a lot of it's just like, if, if I saw myself four, five years, even four years ago, just starting Storm Sensor, I never would have thought that I could have gotten to here. And um, as a result, it's actually kind of cool. I was at an accelerator, it was all the CEOs were sitting around a table and they were talking about their fear of failure and they were scared that if they didn't get to the next stage of their company, they failed. Or if they couldn't do this thing with their company, they failed or that thing, with, they failed. And I'm sitting there looking around them at this table with them and thinking like, I got to here. Even if we stop tomorrow, I successfully got to here and that was really hard. Like we've met, I had all these milestones that we've hit that I never thought were freaking possible for me to do. It's just me. I mean, my team, obviously they're, their why, like, <laughs> I can't do any of this alone, nothing, I could do nothing by myself. Um, but I think that's, that's the biggest thing is that I have been able to go through some incredibly difficult things and, and ultimately do it well. And a lot of that is due incredibly to my husband, to the network of people that I have, our investors and our supporters and our team and our advisors. Um, 
and also I'm an introvert. And the our like I said, our network is is enormous. I never thought that I could have met and talked to and worked with all of those people, like thousands of people. It's astonishing. So there's there's a lot. I think that's pretty cool. Yeah, I think that is something that is really important to know from the path of becoming an entrepreneur. Uh, to find out what you're really capable of. Uh, and again, like when I started out, uh, as, you, as you say, like my idea was to put like a very a small, simple business that would just give a couple of thousand dollars a month, something like that. And, and, and I thought that that was my limit. And looking back, like being able to do a lot of things that I have done by the same as you, it's like, huh, I, I never thought I, was able to do that. <laughs> exactly. And half the time you when you get to there, it's after some horrific, like soul shattering, crushing event. And then you get through it and then you did it. And it's astonishing because who knew? Definitely. And what are your plans for a storm sensor? Like what what is the goal that you have set up for the future of, of, of this company? That's a, there are a few things. Um, so right now we have to get through this pandemic and an economy that's going to be shaky at best uh, because most of our, our, our customers are cities. And as you're perfectly well aware, um, cities are about to be, or they've already been hit very hard economically through this virus and the shutdowns. So um, working with those cities to figure out either ongoing funding or alternative funding sources because the solution or the problem that we're solving um, urban flooding and sea level rise and climate change like those things aren't going to change as a result of COVID so this cities have to implement some kind of solution so we want to work with them to do that with them uh, over the next year to two years um, we also anticipate doing very likely doing another raise if we don't get the grant funding or the revenue to um, to start looking internationally. So right now, you know, we're primarily on the, while we're based in Seattle, we're primarily installing in the, on the Midwest um, and the East Coast and the Southeast. Um, so moving from there to um, Canada, Central America, um, Europe, obviously, and then looking at ways to look at in developing countries because those communities are, I mean, in some cases, just like in the poor neighborhoods in, in the United States, um, so many of the issues that flooding causes, like uh, health effects, uh, job loss, home losses, um, if you don't have uh, financial strength, you can't bounce back from that like other people can. So really emphasizing the deployment and implementing solutions and resiliency solutions um, within uh, lower income neighborhoods in addition to um, the rest of the cities in the United States, and then also applying that same to the world. Because yeah. we can't be a healthy, thriving human society if we don't take our, care of ourselves and in doing so take care of our planet. Definitely. And, and I think that Central America, you're going to have like a, <laughs> a, a good time checking out these systems because... Oh. Uh, again, like El Salvador, every time that it rains hard, uh, it's pandemonium, like apocalypse <laughs> kind mm -hmm. of level of things. And, and we have an extra problem next to the sewage water is that uh, people over here are still uh, having issues on a cultural problem, which is like this idea that you should not throw trash to the streets. Like yeah. this is something that hasn't been picked up here. So that's mm -hmm. one big part of the problem. Like when, when rain comes, like it picks all, all the trash and and even like so certain parts that were, uh, because we had like very tiny parts where they have actually upgraded the system and, and put like bigger, bigger pipes and all that, but they still have a problem because uh, things get locked up and, and then everything uh, goes into flood and when they go and try to see what happened well what happened is that there is a lot of trash that has come through the sewage and has uh, clogged the, the tubes and and, and and that's the problem mm -hmm. and that's like always the problem like 
uh, the, the cultural factor of, of people uh, throwing things into into the street or into the rivers that they shouldn't. Uh, and, and again, like, uh, I think if you go through countries in Latin America, you are going to find, uh, if you're looking for problems to analyze, <laughs> you have the gold mine here. <laughs> <laughs> well, you guys aren't alone with the, the throwing the trash in the streets. We have that too. Not as I don't think as much, um, but there are areas that are pretty pretty bad. I mean, we do some of our networks actually monitor garbage levels in sewers, so they know when to clean them out. So yeah. it is a yeah. And, and again, like we don't have like as, as much technology uh, uh, as you do over there, but like. It, our technology is like sending somebody to, to clean that up, and <laughs> and yeah. it's not uh, it's not uh, a, a fun job to do. <laughs> no, it's not. I've had to do it, unfortunately. So <laughs> it's pretty gross. <laughs> Human, we're not we're not the cleanest species on the planet at all. We tend to decimate. Yeah. Uh, but but still, like uh, something that you mentioned, and, and this is the the hard thing about nature is that we might be on lockdown, we we like we might be in quarantine. But as you say, like just because we are not economically ready, or because uh, we are in the middle of this issue, that doesn't mean that nature is going to stop. And that's the scary part, like mm -hmm. uh, that even if we are not ready, like things will still happen and, and we need to find a, a way to be ready in the face of everything that is happening. Uh, and, and, and those are, I think, the, like, the really hard questions and that we need to think about. Uh, I think it's great that we have advanced, technologically speaking, in, in many areas that we are living probably in one of the best moments of mankind to live, like just the fact that we can be in quarantine and that there is still sectors of humanity that can still do something thanks to the internet. And as you mentioned, like you can still advance on your company because of, of the tools we have right now at the same time, uh, we are still able to work because of the tools that we have now. Uh, but we are still have to face a lot of issues uh, that we are not thinking about. And, 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 and yeah, for me, it's kind of a, this is a weird kind of thinking uh, that I cause on my hand because I do not have much faith when it comes to humanity in times of where everything is going good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I think that's where we go and, and make these huge mistakes. Yes. But when things get really, really kind of hard, uh, I do have a lot of faith in humanity there. I think that's where a lot of people who are very competent can get like down to work and, and, and create amazing solutions that will be able to help us reach in the next stage. And, and I think definitely that you are one of those amazing human beings that that will stare like, horrible problems in the face and and think like, okay, how can we solve this? I, I think that is amazing. So if people want to find more about you and about the Storm Sensor, where would be the best place to do it? Uh, the best place is our website to start. So www.stormsensor.io. And then you can always send me an email at Aaron at stormsensor.io and I'm happy to answer. Awesome. And is there any last advice that you would like to give the people listening to this interview that we haven't talked yet into this interview? Goodness. We've covered quite a range of topics. I think, I think maybe just more of a reiteration, I guess, than advice. Um, like one thing, like we're, we're in a really, really tough time right now with the COVID-19 and the economic crisis and the shutdowns that we're experiencing. And it might feel like you're stuck or alone or helpless, but I think it's important to realize, like you said, Rodrigo, the, um, 
The capabilities of humanity in times of stress are astonishing. And what I think we have right now, even with people losing their jobs, um, is a concentration of potential brilliance where you can take the time that you have to do something extraordinary, whether it's with your family or your community or on a broader scale. So, and we can all do it. I mean, if I can do it, believe me, anyone, <laughs> anyone can do it. Um, just keep moving forward. Yeah, I think that's, that's a message that I try to say as well. I keep, and again, like if I was able to do something at some stand <laughs> and everybody else can definitely do something. <laughs> <laughs> well, it has been a great interview, and I really thank you that you have put your time uh, to give us here and share your knowledge, your experiences. Uh, I, I know that you must be really busy uh, uh, facing all the all, all the problems uh, uh, about this lockdown uh, with your team, but I am really grateful that you made some time to talk to us. Thank you so much for having me, Rodrigo. This was wonderful. I appreciate it. So this has been the last episode of Level Up. If you like it, please click the like button below. Also click the subscribe button to get notified when new interviews come up. Or if you're listening from the uh, from the podcast, then just follow this podcast so you can be notified when new episodes come up. Until next time. <laughs>